the oral history of Ken Poulton, recorded on uh, May 13th, 2021, for the Computer History Museum, but not at the museum because of the pandemic. And I'm Günther Steinbach. So uh, hello, Ken, and uh, thank you very much for donating your history to the museum. Well, sure. I I wanted to do this interview because of your work on uh, massively parallel ADCs, but uh, this uh, history covers all of your work and career. All righty. Let's start with uh, the background. Like, uh, where did you grow up? What What's your family background? Uh, your childhood hobbies, maybe? <laughs> okay. Um, so, my parents uh, grew up in Piedmont. It's a, a small town inside, it, it, enclosed in Oakland. Um, and they were actually high school friends, not high school sweethearts. Uh, my dad became an orthodontist and college professor, uh, taught orthodontics. Um, and my mom uh, was a social worker and full-time mom and, and then teacher. Um, my wife, Kate, and I uh, both grew up in, in Oakland. Um, and uh, we were born in 56 and 57. So we were growing up in the, in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and it was, it was a little schizophrenic uh, living in Oakland at the time because we were both right, in, right, right at the uh, uh, a lot of the turmoil of, of the 60s. The Black Panthers were organized uh, in, in downtown Oakland. Um, the uh, uh, demonstrations and, and riots in, in, in Berkeley were, were, were going on uh, uh, just a few miles uh, to the north. Kate actually had, had uh, tear gas drift, drift uh, into her elementary school uh, from, from some of the Berkeley demonstrations one, one time. Um, but at the same time, we lived in the Oakland Hills, which was uh, very white, uh, very uh, uh, de facto uh, segregated. We had school busing going on uh, to, to do de desegregation. Um, but uh, our schools, uh, aside from, aside from the, the busing, tended to be uh, relatively white. And so it was schizophrenic in that way. Um, so in, in high school, I, I was on the ski team for a while. Um, I did uh, a lot of the school plays. Um, the, the peak of my, of my drama career was, was playing Duke Orsino in, in uh, Twelfth Night. And uh, Sir Andrew was uh, played by Tom Hanks. Um, he, he always got the, the zany comic parts uh, in, in, uh, in our plays. Um, and I met Kate backstage uh, during, during uh, one, one of those plays. <laughs> um, I was interested in uh, uh, architecture and, and chemistry in particular in, in high school. Um, and I started programming uh, actually in, in uh, junior high school um, on a, uh, a timeshare computer. We had a, a, uh, a teletype terminal at our middle school. Um, and uh, it was connected to a, a, a computer at uh, uh, Lawrence, Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, and my mom remembers me writing out basic programs in, on, on, on paper. Uh, during during a, a family vacation or two, um, and we'll note that that uh, at exactly the same time, uh, Bill Gates was uh, learning to program on a, a teletype uh, connected to a, a, a distant time sharing computer, and uh, so so we did exactly exactly the same thing, and and our careers have very nearly paralleled exactly since then. <laughs> Give or, give or take a few billion dollars. 
Maybe um, not the same ruthlessness, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I did not have the killer instinct that, that, that he developed. So you, uh, you did get into uh, computer engineering at, at that early age. What about electrical engineering? Um, I didn't do you know, anything, anything hobby-like uh, in high school. Um, one of my summer jobs uh, in, in, in college, uh, the, the first thing I did in, in electronics was uh, working for a tiny company that made uh, weather stations. And you know, this was uh, uh, doing PC boards, uh, what was, was the way they, they uh, built the electronics for this. And I got to do some, uh, some PC board layout using, uh, I forget what the material was called, but, but the uh, sticky, sticky traces that you lay down on, on, uh, on mylar in order to define the, uh, the traces on, on these PC boards. And uh, so that was my, my first uh, connection with layout and, and uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, it didn't, it's, it's not, what really, not what really got me going into, into, into double E though. Um, when I started at Stanford, um, I took classes uh, in chemistry and physics uh, the, in the, the classes that you would do for, for either a chemistry or physics major. And, and almost instantly, I, I got turned off by chemistry because they started with organic chemistry, which, which was basically memorization. Mm -hmm. And the physics class, the introductory class for physics majors, emphasized the, uh, the, 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 that, that in each field you have a few basic principles and a relatively small number of equations from which you can more or less in principle derive the universe. And you know, that, was, that was a pretty, a pretty, striking, pretty striking thing and, and, and pretty exciting. Um, and uh, so I was, I was doing my, my, my physics undergrad. And as I went through that, it, it began to become apparent that, that uh, I wasn't cut out for theoretical physics. I mean, that requires, uh, I did lots of math. I was really good at math, but I wasn't that, I wasn't good enough for, for theoretical physics. Um, and my, uh, my, my physics advisor, uh, advised me to, to try out a, a class in electronics because for a, a uh, working experimental physicist, you know, having electronic stuff is, is uh, part, of, part of what you, what you need all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a, a introductory double E lab and one of the uh, uh, physics uh, major labs uh, at, at similar times. And I was finding that the, uh, the physics labs Wow, they barely worked, and I, I resonated very much with with a quote from from physicist uh, Ernest Rutherford, which was, "If you need a stat statistician to interpret your the the results of your experiment, then you need a better experiment." That's really the way I felt about about my physics labs. And at the same time, I was doing these double E labs, and you put together these components with ten, 10 percent tolerances, and things worked and you got something useful. And I found that really, really appealing. And that was sort of the point at which I, I uh, uh, switched over to a double E as my, as my long-term goal. The other, I mean, the other thing that, that was appealing about double E was that there's, there's still lots of math. Um, it wasn't at the, le at the, at the level of, of theoretical physics math. And so it was a, it was a good fit for me. Um, and I, I finished my physics BS um, and uh, there was a, uh, a program where you could do a master's um, pro program called co-terminal, basically overlapped with your, with your bachelor's program. Um, and so I took an extra year and did both the BS in physics and the, and the master's in double E. Um, and that, that turned out to be uh, a nice fit. And I thought about doing a PhD and, you know, my ad ad advisor was, was of course 
wanted me to, to go that way, but I, I looked, looked at, at, again, what you can do with a, a, a master's in double E and, and uh, the kinds of things you can, you can really build and, uh, uh, and have a, a practical impact and, and uh, decided that the master's was, was you know, really where I wanted to, to stop, stop my education. Um, what so, year did uh, you get the masters? Yeah, yeah. So, I, so, I, so I got the masters, but what I, but I, but I uh, decided not to proceed with the, the PhD. Mm -hmm. So, what year was that? So that was 1980. Got got both degrees in in, in 1980. Okay, so uh, then you must have joined HP right out of college, right? Because right. Last year I attended your forty-year anniversary. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Right, right, right before, right before COVID struck, and I, I remember being being so pleased to, to, to see you. I, I I rushed over and shook your hand, and we were already and and the, at we both we both realized that right after we did that, oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't catch it from each other. Apparently not. <laughs> my my well, yeah my my fortieth uh, anniversary celebration turned out not to be a super spreader event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you look at other companies uh, also? Um, so I I interviewed with a with, with with a bunch of companies, and the one I remembered was was Tektronix. Um, they, they had really creative, uh, interview questions. Um, and, uh, I, I, I very much enjoyed that, but what they, uh, were interested in, in hiring me for was, uh, to work on saw devices, um, which was a, uh, uh, a summer job, which had turned into a, a, a year long part-time job, um, during my last year at Stanford. Um, I'd gotten this job at at, uh, at Ampex Research. Um, you have to be you have to be kind of old to remember Ampex. They used to be the leader in in, in the, uh, video recording. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the company is 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 now gone. But they had a research uh, facility uh, uh, in Redwood City. Um, and and I got a summer job there, basically doing their first saw devices. Um, this might be interesting. Let's get a summer intern to, to try this out. And, and I got to, to learn uh, using Unix and C programming to uh, design, design these devices um, because it's you know, a relatively simple geometric layout, um, but there's some, some filter design involved. Um, and I also got to learn about uh, what it was like working in a, a uh, research lab that depended on government grants. Mm. And, and that made me run the other way from, from that kind of thing. That just this, this even, even though I wasn't directly involved with it as an intern, I could see, I could see these, these guys that I was working with spending a lot of their time churning out these grant applications you know, that were you know, two, inches, two inches thick um, and, and, you know, uh, some, some small fraction of them would, act, would actually get, get funded. And that wasn't particularly appealing to me. And so I knew I was looking for something that was, that was more, uh, had, had, had more practical impacts. And, uh, Professor Bob Dutton, uh, made a connection with me to, to uh, HP um, and uh, H HP Labs, uh, just, just a mile from campus, actually, actually in the Stanford Industrial Park. And they offered me a job doing analog IC design. Um, and that seemed pretty good. And 41 years later, yeah, it seemed like a pretty good fit. <laughs> um, that and I, I uh, started in 1980, um, and the the first job there was working on uh, track and hold circuits uh, for 
uh, building real-time ADCs uh, to, to go into, uh, with the aim to, 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 to put these into oscilloscopes. Um, what was uh, done, done at the time was essentially all analog scopes and there was one digital uh, scope product that was, was very low uh, sample rate. Um, not, not at all the, the kind of real-time scopes that uh, uh, we, we use today. And so really we were, as a department, we, one of our major, major thrusts was to try to uh, bring uh, scopes into the, uh, the, the world of digital. Um, the, uh, the department uh, at the time was, was run by, by Tom Horniak. Um, and he had escaped from communist Czechoslovakia in 1968. They had a brief relaxation of, of uh, travel restrictions. And he and his wife uh, took a suitcase of vacation clothes and left Czechoslovakia and eventually you know, made, made their way to the US. And uh, when I joined, I guess that was 12 years later, um, he, was, he was running our department. And he was, he was a great guy to, great guy to work for. Um, he was, had, had interesting stories and, and this really good grasp of, of, uh, of, of everything technical and, and a real vision of, of pushing, pushing uh, what, we're, what we were doing into uh, uh, HP products. And that was, I think, the thing that was particularly great about, about uh, HP Labs at the time um, was that it was a place where, where you were doing something that was between research and development. The, the aim was always to uh, make something that would eventually uh, contribute to HP products. Well, we, were, we were virtually never doing pure research, um, but we had the, the freedom to do things that were really long-term. And you know, I started in 1980 and, and uh, the, the work that I did didn't come out into a, a product until uh, 1987. And that's the kind of, kind of time horizon that, that uh, uh, we were able to, to do there. Great. Um, what else have you worked on besides data converters? Uh, relatively little, actually. Um, you 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 actually gave me the question ahead of time, and I and I uh, uh, forgot forgot to research it. Um, We've we've done done data converters related to to uh, uh, various instrument product lines, uh, oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, um, uh, RF sources, um, and we dabbled in things like uh, uh, image image sensors. Um, and I've forgotten the there were there was a few other things that that. Uh, uh, Came along the way, but in terms of, of the the major projects that that uh, uh, I've done, and for that matter, uh, most most of our department has done, um, it's really been focused on on A to D converters, and for for a very long time, uh, serial serial data uh, uh, tr transmitters transceivers. I, I, my, my work, my work wasn't wasn't directly uh, very much on on uh, on serial data, but but uh, uh, for a while, about half or, half of our department was was working on that. Okay, and I do remember you also doing system administration to some <laughs> yeah. percentage of your time. Uh huh. Uh, how how did you drift into that? So uh, I'd gotten my, my feet wet in, in Unix uh, back at Ampex in 1979. And 
and that was a, a something that that I enjoyed working in. And when I got to to HP in 1980, uh, they were using these these business computers, which were modeled on on IBM business computers. And oh my God, it was just the most wretched computing environment you could imagine for technical stuff. Um, but HP made them, um, so uh, we were. That's that's what we had available. Um, but by 1983, uh, we started getting a few technical uh, computers, and I think the original one was a deck Vax uh, within labs. And I immediately got an account on that, but but it wasn't it wasn't where I could do my my real work yet. Um, and actually, as I think about it, uh, I ported a, a uh, Unix-like programming environment into the HP 3000 uh, operating system uh, in the first couple of years uh, of uh, being, being at HP. Um, and it basically provided a uh, a programming platform um, that was based on Fortran, because Fortran was 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 what was available on on uh, virtually every computer, um, and a preprocessor called Rat4 for Rational Fortran um, that allowed you essentially some C like for C like syntax uh, before Fortran had any uh, structured programming uh, capabilities. Um, and so I ported that to the HP 3000, and I used that for uh, some of the quite a bit of the of the uh, programming that I did. Basically, things like post processing uh, spice runs. Uh, I'd have you know simulation data, and I, and I'd want to be able to uh, uh, do some analysis of that. And this was a better environment for for doing that kind of of prototype uh, programming. Um, and that turned out to be to be useful enough that uh, I offered it to other other divisions within HP, and and not surprisingly, nobody was interested. And so I got permission to actually sell that uh, as a, uh, a as a business of my own. And so for a while, I had a business called Terminal Software, oh. um, which. I guess I ran till like 1987, um, and you know, basically, people people who were stuck in on the HP 3000 and and wanted a uh, more more Unix-like environment. Um, this was a a, a stopgap uh, that uh, provided some of that some of that support. And so I sold that that package. I think I sold it for like 150 bucks. Um, Initially, and maybe maybe the price went up to three hundred dollars eventually, um, but uh, uh, that was that was mainly mainly good because it was it was uh, other people were actually find, finding what I had what I had done there useful. Um, didn't didn't exactly uh, didn't exactly uh, make a lot of money. <laughs> but uh, uh, another. Little bit of a parallel to to Bill Gates, huh? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, when I when I was doing at at the at the time that I was doing that in, in the early eighties, he he started this little this this little company called called, called Microsoft, and I mean, God, I was doing something Unix like, and and uh, you can. I, I I don't know why he bothered with that with that DOS stuff. So, <laughs> yep. So I uh, I researched your patents, uh -huh. and I saw two patents about mass spectrometers. Um, how did that happen? Um, so uh, one of the things that was uh, particularly neat about about HP Labs and uh, to a lesser extent Agilent Labs was sort of the cross fertilization between 
between different fields. Um, and, and at HP in particular, uh, we had uh, a company that had, we, we, as HP Labs, we were, we were serving a company that had a very, very broad por portfolio of, of products. And you know, basically any of those areas were, were things that were fair game for us to, to consider uh, working, working on. And uh, time of flight mass spectrometry um, was something that uh, we had uh, some products in already and being able to apply the high speed digital, high speed analog to digital converters uh, that we had um, was basically a, a, a spin off of, of the work that we were doing for, for scopes. Hmm. And we didn't actually uh, do any uh, uh, entities directly for that for that product line, uh, but we figured out how to uh, how to use those those entities for that product line. And I should and I should say that uh, August Hidalgo uh, is is the one who figured out how to do that. We we were basically uh, uh, providing support for for his his development within the mass spec. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Agilent later. So you started at HP Labs, then HP spun off Agilent, and more recently Agilent spun off Keysight. And yeah, uh, each time you you were in the spun off part, uh -huh. as was I. Uh, what what was your reaction to those spin offs? Are you okay? Do you agree that they were a good thing or, or were they mistakes in your so, opinion? So, so I, I really felt that, that the, the, the 1999 uh, spinoff of, of Agilent um, from, from HP was, was a, a terrible thing. Um, that, that we had a, a company that, that had had provided some some real synergy, and you know one of the, one of the things that came out of that was the optical mouse, um, that that our department developed the the navigation chip that uh, uh, enabled the the optical mouse. Even though the original the original object for for, for the navigation chip was was a uh, a different application, it was a handheld uh, scanner, handheld uh, paper scanner. Um, that's an example of, of, of the kind of kind of synergy that, that we were able to to provide, and and the time of flight mass spec stuff was was another, and so I I was pretty unhappy about about uh, uh, their splitting, and you know basically it, it narrowed the, the the field of of, of application for labs uh, when when they did that. Um, it didn't take very long to become apparent that, well, at the same time as they did the split, they, they hired Carly Fiorana uh, as the as CEO for HP. Mm -hmm. And it did not take very long at all to become apparent that we were actually really happy not to be working for Carly. Um, that she was, as near as we could tell, uh, opposed to the HP way, um, really, really did her best to, to sabotage that, and uh, was was you know, in my view, one of one of a uh, uh, the beginning of a line of of really disastrous uh, CEOs for, for HP, and the fact that we were not part of that, you know, was a really good thing because she probably would have just cut the whole uh, in, instrument business uh, if, if if it hadn't uh, already been sold. Or, or split off. Um, while we were part of, of, of Agilent, you know, we still had uh, the, the, the chemical and bio biological things. And there was not a huge amount of, of things that came out of that uh, cross, cross disciplinary uh, actions, but, but, but there, were, there were some. Um, when we split off uh, as, as Keysight in 2014, um, I wasn't too 
too pleased about that either. Um, but uh, what that unlocked was the ability of the electronic measurement business to uh, really grow and, and thrive as, as its own business. And what Agilent had been doing was using keys, using electronic measurements as more or less the cash cow to fund biological uh, expansion. Um, and that was, you know, it was a more quickly growing market. Um, so, so presumably it's, it's rational from an MBA point of view. Um, and that's not a good thing from my point of view. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the result of the, of the key site split has been that uh, we are focused on, on our, totally focused on the electronic markets and focused on how we can grow and it's been been quite successful. Um, really exceeded my expectations for uh, uh, what the, the trajectory of, of the company. And it's, it's, it's uh, I, I find, I'm finding that remarkable. And it's, you know, still, still going on at the moment. So that's been pretty cool. Very good. Um, okay, I think we can uh, get to the massively <laughs> parallel ADCs now. Uh, as the fir at first, uh, my first point is, uh, so I, as I said, I research your patents and there is none about uh, massively parallel ADCs. Was that considered not patentable? Um, it, we, we, we looked at it, of course, and uh, we couldn't find a dividing line between the, the massively parallel and the merely mm. uh, two and four X parallel that would yeah. uh, allow us to, to, to really patent the idea. Mm. Um, it's a pity, but, but uh, that's, that's the, the, the way it worked. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, as you as you alluded, uh, time interleaving of ADCs has been had been done before, uh, including with the scopes that you can parallel two channels to get one faster one. So, uh, how did you? What made you propose, or you and your coworkers propose interleaving now dozens of ADCs? Um. So uh, going, going back to uh, our, my, my, my first project, which, which introduced as, as the one giga sample uh, digital scope in, in 1987, um, in, in that project, we, we interleaved four uh, discrete, four, four separate uh, bipolar ADC chips. Um, and uh, I, I made the the uh, gallium arsenide uh, track and hold front end that went in front of those those chips, and that was uh, pretty much of a, of a pattern that that we followed in uh, oscilloscopes uh, up until uh, 2000. That we would build uh, the fastest bipolar ADD converter we could we could make in the processes that were available. And of course, the processes were were advancing, and so that that uh, was a big part in, in what allowed us to, to advance the, uh, uh, the speed that we operated at. Um, but basically we would make the fastest unit A to D converter we could, and then we would interleave two-way or four-way. And I think there was one scope product that, that uh, ended up with 16-way. Um, but I, basically each chip was, was uh, one or later on uh, two-way interleaved on chip. And, and that was sort of the, the paradigm that, that, that we and, and for that matter, uh, everybody doing, doing high-speed converters was, was following. Um, there was a, a development uh, at, at Tektronix uh, in probably the early 90s of a analog uh, storage uh, capture chip, where basically the idea was that you had a, a 
number of, of capac capacitors on, on a, uh, a single chip, and you would store samples into, the, into those capacitors uh, it, with, with a, it, at, at, a, at a high rate. Um, and I forget what rate they, they, they had, but call it, call it a, a, a giga sample. And then you would read the charge out of those capacitors at a very low rate um, and uh, uh, do, the, do the digital analog to digital conversion that way. And we became aware of that because, because they were able to uh, undersell our scopes uh, pretty dramatically. It's in terms of, of how much high speed circuitry you have, it's a very simple system. Um, we, we did some analysis and, and and you could see just from their spec sheets, uh, but you could also see from from working with one of those those scopes that you had had a very limited storage, something like a thousand or fifteen hundred samples, and you had a bunch of of analog artifacts uh, that showed up due to the uh, the analog storage and the analog readout process, and it was clear that that this was never going to scale up to uh, the the mega sample. Or, or beyond rate uh, that, that we uh, really wanted to, to get to. Um, and uh, James Kang and, and, and John Taney uh, wor worked on, on this analysis. It, they, they were in our department at the time. And they came up with the, the idea of, of, well, could we use we don't want to do analog storage, um, but we'd like to use CMOS. What is CMOS good at? Well, it's not, uh, it's not very good at analog. The, the, the transistors are, are less accurate. And it's not very good at going fast. The transistors are, well, A to Ds were at the time 80 times slower uh, in, that, in, in, in CMOS processes than we had in, in bipolar processes, eight zero. Um, but what CMOS could do was give you lots of transistors. And so they said, what could we do with that? And the, the fundamental idea that, that developed out of that was uh, that you optimize the, the data converter not for the highest possible sample rate, but you optimize the converter for the highest energy efficiency. And you also want to need to make it relatively compact. And those two characteristics would allow you to put lots of these on a, on a single chip. And the integration capabilities of CMOS were already at the level that, that we could put, put lots and lots of transistors on a, on a chip, more, more than we had uh, uh, a need for, even in these massively parallel systems. Um, and so it, it's, it was really this change of focus from the fastest unit converter you can make, and then we'll somehow put put inter, interleave some, some of them together, and 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 uh, it was it was it was sort of a a, a clumsy uh, way that we the way that we did the interleaving there um, to really focusing on power efficiency. Um, as the uh, as as the main goal, and just put lots of them in, and uh, we 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 talked with the, the scope division about that, and and they said, yeah, yeah, that that that's that that sounds nice. It's a good labs project, <laughs> um, and so unlike previous developments, uh, you know, they were not counting on on us doing this, and it was risky enough that we weren't counting on it working. Um, but we uh, did our, our we did a test chip with just one one slice to prove out the uh, the uh, uh, current uh, current based uh, A to D architecture, um, and then we built a chip that had thirty two slices uh, on the chip and would operate at four giga samples per second, and four giga samples per second was was already the the uh, fastest rate of a uh, of a bipolar uh, A to D converter, um, and we 
went through that. We originally were, were, were looking at, at doing this with, uh, with memory on the chip. Um, it's sort of, sort of an obvious integration uh, when, you're, when you're working in CMOS. Um, but for the first chip, we decided that was, that was uh, uh, more complex than we wanted to bite off. And so we did, did a chip which was just uh, parallel output uh, of, of the data with no storage. Um, and it worked. Our first silicon, first silicon worked really very much, very, very close to the uh, uh, way we'd simulated it. And we uh, got, got that going on the, on the bench and, and showed it to the uh, uh, guys in the in scope division. And they said, oh, really? Huh. I, I guess we better make a scope around that. Um, and so that fit into their, their uh, mid-range scope line. But since it wasn't, wasn't something that they'd already started, um, it, it took until uh, 2001 for that scope to uh, uh, be introduced. We, we'd, we'd actually got first silicon on this chip in, in 1998. Um, and it took until 2001 for that scope to be introduced. And so we didn't publish this this chip until uh, 2002. While we were, uh, while, while that, after we had finished that chip and, and once they got started on, on the uh, uh, scope using the, that four gig sample chip, they, they looked at, at uh, their whole product line and there had actually been some consideration of whether we should still be competing with tech uh, at, at in, in, in the high-end scopes. Um, we were, I think, not doing very well uh, at competing. And they decided to, to really try to invigorate that, that high-end scope line and said, what we need from you is a, uh, a 20 gig sample per second uh, A to D using this technology. Um, and we've been thinking 16 and, and we really couldn't, goose it up another 25%. We end up going to, instead of 64 slices, 80 slices. And it's a little factor of five that, that uh, complicated a lot of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we just, needed, we just needed that extra 25% in order to, to hit 20 gig sample per second. As it, as it turned out, that, that was a, a really good call from, from marketing um, that, that that was going to, uh, in the long run, that, that was a, a, a much better seller than, than a 16 gig sample per second would have been. Um, and so uh, we, we went ahead on, on that second, second chip. The first, first chip uh, was, was a, uh, basically a, a four person project, which was already you know, about twice as much twice as many people as, as we had uh, on, on previous uh, data converter chips. Um, so John, John and James started, started that, uh, that work, but, but left the company. Um, and uh, Robert Neff and I and Andy Burstein and, and Meredith Hashami uh, built that first 32-way uh, 32, 32 uh, uh, data converter. Um, and the, the the next one that was going eight ways at, at, at 20 gig samples was was like a, a nine person uh, a chip prod project, which is not that big a deal in 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 uh, uh, CPUs. Teams were much larger already for, for CPUs, but for a data converter that was that was the uh, biggest project team. In fact, in fact, it was. As far as I knew from publications, it was the biz biggest project team that uh, that had been done, um, which is, you know, <laughs> a, a dubious distinction <laughs> in some ways. Um, but it, it points out sort of one of the things about about the the massively parallel architecture is that it, it is just more complex. Um, you you have. Uh, Sort of the same level of complexity uh, as a as a non interleaved converter at the slice uh, slice ADC level, and then you have the the interleaving system 
um, which has to have sampling and clocking and usually has uh, some DSP, which, which is looking at uh, all of your samples together. And that ends up being adding, adding quite a bit of, of overhead uh, and, and a lot of complexity to, to the chip. And, and one of the things that, that comes along with, with uh, interleaving are the artifacts that you have from, from interleaving. And when, you're, when your ADC slices are not perfectly identical, and of course they, they never, never can be perfect, um, then you get uh, interleaving spurs um, due, to these, uh, due to these mismatches. And basically you, you, can, you can see that if you have an offset uh, between the uh, 32 op different off offsets in, in the, uh, the 32 uh, slices um, that you're going to have a repeating pattern of, of offset voltages in the data you, that you recover. Um, and similarly, if you have different gains or, or different uh, uh, sample timings uh, from, the, from the, the mini slices in, in your data converter, um, those cause different kinds of spurs. And so uh, figuring out how to do the calibration for those and whether to insert those corrections um, in analog uh, offset correction, for instance, or in uh, digital corrections um, became a, a major part of, of the development of these chips. And that's part of, you know, a big part of why, why the teams had to get, get bigger in order to do them. Okay. Um, so the, the timeline was uh, you got the, you taped out the first chip in the late, uh, 90s, 1998, you said, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it uh, became a product in 2001. Uh-huh. And uh, so that first one, uh, did it already have DSP for uh, correction? Or Let's could see. you could you make okay. them good enough for within half an LSB or something? So. So one of the things that we that we we had to do uh, in going to CMOS was uh, we had to introduce uh, calibration just for the the unit ADC slice. Mm -hmm. um, the the gain in CMOS transistors is much lower than in bipolar transistors, and the offsets in CMOS transistors are. are maybe 10 times worse than in bipolar transistors. And so you really had to, to rethink how you were going to uh, uh, deal with analog accuracy. And one of the changes we made was in, in the uh, bipolar, bipolar ADCs, um, we'd really focused on making a, uh, uh, an ADC that was accurate if it was a, a eight bit, a to D converter, we, we tried to make it accurate to, to eight bits without any trimming. Mm -hmm. um, and in CMOS, that wasn't gonna be possible. And so uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, John and James came up with was the idea of a current mode pipeline A to D converter, um, where rather than using voltage as, as the, uh, the variable that you were operating on, in, in this in each stage of the pipeline that you were actually using current as the as the uh, unit and be, because because current uh, the, the CMOS uh, open loop circuits could be uh, more linear in current than in voltage. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we that that uh, we had to do differently than existing practice was in, in CMOS circuits and actually in, in a whole lot of bipolar. Uh, data converters, um, closed loop amplifiers was were the norm um, because the act because that was how you could could uh, deal with the accuracy and, and poor linearity of, of of CMOS transistors. In order to go fast enough, we didn't want to have closed loop circuits, um, and 
so that was another another reason why why the uh, the current mode uh, approach was was uh, valuable at the time. Um, and then we went to uh, reduced radix architecture, where within your pipeline you're no longer uh, changing by a, an exact factor of two at each stage of the conversion. Um, the, the the normal you can think of think of a, a normal pipeline converter as as long division. You're going to say, and but in but in a, a base two, basically you're going to say is is my voltage above or below the the middle threshold, and then uh, take the residue from from that that conversion and do another uh, conversion of is it above or below the threshold. But each stage you're going to use a factor of, of two between stages. And what we did instead was, was a reduced radix architecture where we actually had an intentional gain that was about 1.7, I think. Um, and uh, basically we didn't rely on the, on the gain of stages to be accurate at all. Uh, we, as long as it was somewhere between uh, 1.6 and, and less than two, um, it would be good enough and we would do the uh, uh, correction in a uh, digital uh, circuit, uh, which we called a, a radix, radix converter, after after the uh, analog conversion. Um, and so that led to uh, just within the just within the the uh, ADC slice, um, a, a a digital support circuit, uh, which was which was correcting for all the. Uh, all the all the offset and, and, and gain errors of, of the uh, individual transistors. Have I answered the question? <laughs> I've, I know I've gone a long way around here. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the uh, the TSP actually that looks at all everything uh, is that on the chip or off the chip? Ah. Okay, so the so the DSP for the for the radix conversion um, has been on the chip from from the uh, the very first ones that we did. Um, DSP that does uh, uh, correction for uh, interleaving has been uh, something that that in scopes we've we've had uh, outside the chip and. Basically, in the, in the environment of, a, of an oscilloscope, um, you know that you have a CPU in the box, um, and what we what we needed to provide on the chip was the insertion of the correction, uh, whether it's digital or, or or analog insertion, but the determination of the calibration coefficients uh, would be uh, done by software in in, in the box. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was that was a freedom that that we had as as designers because we knew we were going into a uh, an instrument application um, and not trying to uh, uh, sell to uh, any any kind of application where a CPU might not be available. And you rely on calibration signals that go yeah. to the input of the. I mean, on, yeah. on known signals that go to the input of the ADC. That's right. So, uh, some there, there 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 are some some kinds of calibrations that that uh, nowadays are done internally uh, within a scope, and I have to confess that that I don't know how all the calibrations are done in our most recent recent scopes. Last time I looked, uh, there was a calibration output from the. Uh, Front panel of the scope that you would cable into the uh, the the input channels one by one, and the scope would use that that known signal. And and it's uh, at various times has been just a single signal, or or sometimes it's been a series of different kinds of signals um, to do different kinds of calibrations. So okay. the user has to stop measuring for a while and do calibration. That's right. That's right. Which is which is what what is what is known as as, as foreground calibration, mm -hmm. um, 
as as opposed to the background calibration where uh, the, uh, the the chip chip or or or, or the or the system uh, is able to do calibration uh, while the user is getting getting their their real data a conversion done done by the chip. And there's been a lot of, I mean, one of the things that that uh, CMOS converters and and massively interleaf converters have have uh, stimulated is is quite a lot of of work in various kinds of calibrations and uh, background calibration has has got a lot of appeal um, and has a lot of a lot of cases where it works really well. And then there's cases where it, it, it doesn't work so well because uh, you either need to make assumptions about the user signal that's going through the A to D converter, or you need to be able to insert a, a, uh, a signal along with the user signal. Um, and so it's not a background calibration always, always has some kinds of, of, of limitations. And so that has, has uh, in, in addition to, to adding a lot of complication to, uh, to, to your data converter. And so we have stayed with, with foreground calibrations for, for quite a lot of our work um, for, for those reasons, particularly because we're trying to do things which are uh, instruments which are general purpose and, and you don't know what, what, the, uh, what signal the, the user is going to present. How much work have you done on calibration issues? Uh, so I did some of the some of the work on on the original calibration uh, that we did for for the uh, uh, thirty two way uh, massively interleaved ADC. Um, Mostly, once we got that, once we got that 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 prototype uh, running, then we were able to hand off that work to uh, uh, the scope division. Um, Robert Saponis in, in Colorado Springs was was somebody that we worked with quite a bit on on that, and and uh, uh, I'm guessing that that uh, some of the code that, that he developed in in uh, 2000, 2001 probably is uh, uh, still living in some of our scopes. Uh, how how many parallel ADCs do you have nowadays? If you can tell us. Uh, let's see. I can't tell you because I I'm afraid of giving the wrong answer. Um, I, I, my, my uh, involvement with the, the scope ADCs went through about 2005. Um, and uh, since then, uh, my work has, has shifted to, to focusing on uh, direct to RF uh, DACs and, and ADCs. So I don't have the, I don't have in my head the, the uh, details on, on, uh, what we're doing currently in, in uh, scope ADCs. Okay. Um, in as order of magnitude or roughly, do you know how many uh, different Agilent and Keysight products <laughs> have been or are using these massively parallel ADCs? Um, at, at uh... One point, there was, somebody did a, a count, and there were 81 scope products. This was se several years ago. There are 80, 81 scope products that used the original uh, four giga sample per second uh, a ADC that we that we built. Um, that that was it, it. Got paired with with a uh, a, a custom data data capture chip um, and it started out in a mid-range scope and 
and migrated into into uh, lower performance. What what were the uh, low end scopes as the as the performances uh, came up to that level for for what was defi defined as as low end less expensive scopes, and uh, the the team in Colorado Springs uh, was able to uh, keep doing cost reduction on that. Um, and uh, it was really a, a, a remarkable thing that had, had a, a very long lifetime, um, just sort of hit the, hit the right thing at the right time. And the, the uh, I don't think any of the rest of our, uh, other of our uh, ADA converters have had such a long life, but you know, basically, basically, uh, Virtually all of our all of our scopes uh, since I forget about about sometime sometime in the late two thousands uh, have been based on the the massively parallel architecture, various various chips. Um, how would you compare time interleaved ADCs with multi core CPUs? Um, so they they. Uh, Excuse me. <laughs> um, they really reflect the the uh, the same change of of, of focus um, that we made that change from from what is the fastest unit uh, converter or in their case CPU core uh, you can make. To what is the most power efficient one you can make, and and then put a bunch of them on on the same chip, and and clearly we were driven by the same uh, the, the same realization that that uh, CMOS was not going to provide uh, provide massively higher clock rates, um, but it did have this whole other dimension that uh, we could take advantage of. And I went, you, you, you gave me this question ahead of time. And so I went looking and, and we, we built our, our first massively parallel interleaved ADC in 97 and, and uh, turned it on in 98. And uh, it took us until 2002 to publish it, but that was two years before CPUs suddenly plateaued on, on uh, their clock rate. So I like to think that, that we, uh, we, we figured this out first. <laughs> I can't prove that. <laughs> Very good. How do you see the future of, of ADCs? Uh, do you think uh, even slower ADCs will go to massively parallel or uh, is this going to be uh, more really still more for the very highest performance. So at, at, at one point I was asked when when will every every ADC be interleaved? And and the easy answer to that is never. Um, there are it's it's basically you know another another architectural tool um, that that we as as data converter design, designers uh, have to work with nowadays. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, problem of, of interleaving spurs is something that, uh, is, is something that, that we were able to tolerate in, uh, uh, oscilloscopes and basically, you know, time domain applications, uh, also like serial data, uh, generation and, and, and capture. Um, they're they're not that sensitive to to uh, low level low level interleaf spurs, where where low level is is sort of at the the, the minus sixty db dbc level. Um, but when you go to the RF world, um, they're a lot more sensitive to that that kind of thing, and uh, so there's there's a more careful trade-off that has to be made for for how do you use interleaving 
uh, in RF applications. And, and uh, that will always drive quite a, quite a good fraction of, of uh, data converters to uh, uh, not use interleaving um, because they just avoid that whole, that whole issue. Um, that said, there's, a, a, if, you, if you actually look at the specs of, of applications, um, there's an awful lot of applications that can, can tolerate uh, interleaving spurs at, at the levels that, that we, can, we can achieve. And it, what, we, what we get in, in scopes is sort of at the minus 60 dBC level, give or take. Uh, we made a, uh, an ADC for spectrum analyzers that, that uh, got to uh, uh, minus 85 dBC. Um, but there's always folks, I mean, your spectrum analyzer can look, can look down, down to 100 dBC pretty easily. And there's a very strong cosmetic issue of what the heck is that spur? That's, you know, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna see that in, in, in my spectrum analyzer. And even if your application really isn't sensitive to, to spurs at that level, and you know, we look at, at communications waveforms where uh, we're talking about 1% EVM, you know, which really means that if you've got something at, at minus 50 dBC, um, that's already deep, well, well in your noise. But still, people will, will see that spur at, at minus 80 and say, oh, wow, what's, what the heck is that? Um, and so there's a, a cosmetic issue that I think is, is real in, 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 in the sense of, of being able to uh, uh, use it in, in RF, uh, real in terms of marketing things for RF. Okay. Okay, I think that's uh, all my questions about your work. Um, what do you do outside of work? Well, let me before we before we leave okay. leave this. I I wanted to uh, say something. You know, look. You you sort of got me to 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 look back over over my whole career and 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 I've been been lucky to have have my career cover uh, several several revolutions. Um, you know, one has been the the change from analog scopes to digital scopes, um, and uh, we we were certainly certainly enabled that, and and uh, the the scope division uh, once once that was possible uh, jumped jumped on that big time. Um, the movement from from bipolar ADCs to the to the massively parallel uh, CMOS ADCs um, has been a, a a huge change for for high speed. ADCs and the the movement uh, from uh, uh, up conversion uh, chains for RF to uh, direct to RF, both for for up conversion and, and, and down conversion, um, is something that's that's in progress right now, and that's you know as I mentioned because because of of, of spurious issues, it's, it's uh, taking longer to, to happen. Um, and again, that certainly won't, won't uh, take place everywhere, but it's, it's something that uh, uh, we're participating in and, and uh, uh, it's providing a lot of, lot of opportunities. Okay. I guess uh, an RF is going digital, so to speak, right? That's, uh... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just like uh, serial commute data com is going uh, digital. Right. Yeah. Put it, just just stick an ADC in front of, at, at, the, at the front end. No problem. OK, so uh, what do you do outside of work? <laughs> so so uh, long ago, I used to do uh, stage tech and, and stage management uh, with uh, theater works. Mm. Um, 
And after our, our first son was born, I, I found that, that uh, I could uh, do my job and I could uh, uh, run, run shows with, with theater works and, and I could be a parent and oops, I could only do two out of three of those. So, <laughs> so, so, so that, that had, to, had to fall by the wayside. Um, when my sons were a little older, I, I, I had been in, in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and uh, uh, I uh, found myself thrust into uh, being a Cub Scout and Boy Scout leader for, for just 11 years. Um, so <laughs> we did a lot of outings that, for that. Um, and then uh, around 1999, um, I worked with a uh, local group uh, that was uh, working on fibers of the home uh, for uh, uh, Palo Alto. The, the aim was to, to have uh, the Palo Alto Utilities Department um, add another utility, which would be you know, fiber to the home data network. Uh, as, a, as an open, open network and, and separate that from the, uh, from the ISPs. Um, and we actually got, got them interested enough to, to build a trial. And you know, one neighborhood had a, a, a trial, trial system, I think in, in the year 2000. Um, and we had a, a, a plan that would cost about $50 million and, and probably would have, uh, would, would have broke even in, in five years. And, and after that been, you know, part of the utility uh, uh, revenue stream that, that the city, uh, city relies on, but probably wasn't good enough for, for the city council. Um, they wanted something that was a 100% sure thing. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, they, they found their sure thing. Um, they spent $50 million on, uh, uh, remodeling the uh, or, or rebuilding uh, the five libraries in, in, in the city. Um, and that has a, a absolutely guaranteed return of zero. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> different priorities. Oh, and, and six months ago, I finally got fiber to the home from, from Sonic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years later. So that actually is not in my neighborhood, which is only a mile from yours. Yes. Well, call Sonic and, and ask. Uh, they they did not. In fact, this is this is running over AT and T's uh, optical network. Oh, okay. But uh, it may it might be available in, in your neighborhood. I don't know. Okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> then, as 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 a. Uh, uh, a recreational thing. I've been windsurfing since 1990 and mm. kite surfing since 2001, uh, when that when that took off, and then kite foiling for the last five hey, years. What is that? Oh, you you put a hydrofoil uh, un, under your under your kite kite board, oh. so you ride the hydrofoil instead of the board on the water. Okay, and, and you can uh, go even faster. You can you can go faster, or or you can or you can uh, turn turn more smoothly. Uh, different 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 ways to uh, to enjoy that. Okay. And then a couple of years ago, I got a one wheel, so I've been using that that uh, one wheel electric skateboard quite a bit during the winters. Last month, I got a wing foil. A so what? A wing foil. Wing so foil. That, so it's it's a it, 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 it sort of looks like look, looks like windsurfing, except you have a inflatable wing instead of instead of a, uh, a hard hard boom and, and hard uh, mast sail. Oh, okay. And you do it on a hydrofoil also. Okay. So, so you have a shaped kind of solid wing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except it's not solid; it's inflated. Yeah, yeah. It uses inflatable inflatable leading edge. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and so, if I remember right, you have the scars and the metal pieces inside <laughs> you to, to prove that you're doing it in a hard way. <laughs> I, 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 I broke my right foot in, in one place and my, my and different time I broke my left ankle in four places. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I got three, 
and, and over the years, I've gotten free rides, rides in rescues from the Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> Your tax dollars at work. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the interview and uh, good luck with uh, windsurfing. <laughs> And, I, I, uh, I, have, I have to say one thing before we go. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I alluded that, that uh, uh, HP Labs and our, our transformation into, into Agilent Labs and Keysight Labs, you know, has, has, has been a good fit. But, you know, it's, it's, it's more than a good fit. As, as, as you know, since you, you worked in our department, um, it's, it's a, this phenomenal group of people who are both really smart and actually really good people to work with. Um, and, you know, that's been the, the thing that, that has been uh, really the, the, the luckiest thing in, in my career is to have this, this great group of people. And, you know, all, all the stuff that we've talked about has been, has been the, the, the work of, of a lot of people. Um, I've just been the, the one who's been uh, uh, spanned the, the, the most years to, uh, to remain talking about it. Yeah, I, I do agree that uh, that was the best place I've ever worked to, that department. Okay, thank Alrighty. you and uh, bye. Well, thanks, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs>